All right, everybody, this is Ross, and I thought I would update you guys on the insanity that is my garden this year. My summer garden is looking so productive. I'm gonna have so many tomatoes, so much food out of this little area that it's just, uh, it's just mind blowing, truthfully. I, I think, um, I really I wanted to give you guys an update because we've been seeing such good results so far. I've also been running into a little bit of uh, some issues because uh, these tomato plants, as we described in other videos, is that we're gonna grow them vertically. And when you grow tomato plants vertically, typically you train them as one single stem up a pole, up a wire, up this uh, tomato twine here that I have. And I figured to myself, I'm gonna do two. I'm gonna try and do two different leaders that way it'll keep them a bit more compact, a bit more small, because these trellises I have set up here, they're only about five feet off the ground. So they're not very tall. And I know from experience of growing tomatoes vertically is that they actually will very easily in one season reach 10 feet, which is actually the, the height of these taller ones behind it, um, where I actually have the melons and the cucumbers growing because they actually get even taller or have the potential to get even taller. Um, so for me, I'm like, well, I wanna maximize the amount of tomatoes I get. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what's the difference if they reach the top and then that's kind of it? I have so many tomatoes in here that I'm gonna be like tomatoed out. I'm gonna be done. I would say probably sometime in like the middle of August, I'm gonna have like pounds and pounds of tomatoes every day that I can't eat them, I can't keep up with them, I'm gonna have to give them away. I, my plan is, as I've said in other videos, we're gonna make sauce, 20 different batches of sauce with 20 different tomatoes to see which tomato makes the best sauce. This one here actually is for stuffing. It's called the, uh, what is it? Stemig stew, if, that, if I'm pronouncing that right. So this one, you actually open it up uh, and stuff it kind of like a pepper and it has thicker walls to it. Very interesting. So all these tomatoes have very different purposes. Some of them are like beef steaks, like this one here. It's got really nice coloring to it already. It's beautiful getting those anthocyanins in there. Some of them are even just super productive. I think this one here is a, uh, man, what's the name of that one? I think it's like Stupus or something, or one of the very early, it's one of the earliest tomatoes. I can't remember, it's a Russian variety. And then back here, by the way, I still have to trellis these guys up along their strings. You know, I've been pruning them and clipping them. You can see some of these clippings on the ground of the tomatoes because I came in here a couple days ago, but I still have to come in here and fix all of them. They're just a giant mess to some extent. And it's better to really keep these nice and neat to help prevent disease as we might be seeing now that we've been getting a lot of rain, just an absolute ton of rain. And you really have to pay attention, by the way, to these melons and these cucumbers because that fusarium wilt can come in and really cause some havoc. So what I'm gonna do very soon, actually, is spray these guys with some Dynagro Protect, give them a little bit of silica. That'll really help fight against disease and mildew, fusarium wilt. But I've been overwhelmingly overwhelmed by how happy I am at the result of these. Not all of them look so great. You know, some of them are a little bit slower than others. I have to trellis some of these over here, like this guy. So, you know, we've had such a crazy storm that the, the vines tend to get a little bit knocked down, but you kind of just wrap this around the wire and then they start to stand up. They get even really large leaves, as you can see back here with these cucumbers. Uh, and this, I think, gives them more photosynthesis than if they were on the ground. I, I, at least that's kind of my hunch. And then, of course, as you let them grow, these melons and even the cucumbers, you let the side shoots come out. And you can see here, like here's a side shoot that came out. I clipped off the, uh, the growth. And then actually I need to clip this off so that this doesn't continue to grow. You leave a leaf here. You can leave this or you can remove it. But this first flower that forms will almost always be a female flower that will get pollinated and uh, could potentially produce a decent fruit. But I do already have on some of these, I have fruits down here at the base that are pretty close to the ground that have been forming and 
across the board, a lot of these melon plants now at this point have some sort of fruit formation. Once you start to see this fruit formation, you're looking at um, roughly, here's another one down here. You're looking at roughly, um, I think it's 30 to 45 days after the fruits have formed by the time they're ripe. And this is critical because now we actually can time them and know when they're going to ripen, but also we start to know, or at least we're trying to get them to ripen at a warmer time of my year. If we have the, the heat and the temperatures from now until they're ripe, we're going to have a higher bricks potentially. We're going to have a higher fruit quality in these melons. And that's absolutely critical with these very exotic dessert melons. I have so many varieties in here of cantaloupes, like Petit Gris de Rene and uh, you know, I have uh, also the, um, what are the, what are these, what are the names? I'm blanking on the names. We have musk melons, but we also have the, um, oh man, those really French melons that I'm talking about that are uh, cantaloupes. I can't remember the name, I'm blanking. But it's really critical, I think, growing these very specialty, exotic, you know, rare um, heirloom melons. Some of them are hybrids in here, by the way, but this is, I think, really critical for these very difficult to grow varieties. Some of them just don't really grow very well and we had actually a lot of trouble transplanting these things in. Um, but, uh, you know, if I would have gotten my seeds off to a better start, I think ideally what I should have done is, like what I did last year, is put the low tunnels up and then just direct seed underneath the tunnels. Uh, the tomatoes would be huge, the melons would be huge, they'd be so much further progressed than they are. You can see that tomato right there. That came up as a volunteer uh, underneath the low tunnel. And it's huge and it's got tons of fruit that'll ripen very soon. Not that some of these transplants I put in aren't necessarily almost at the same level. They're almost there. Like probably this guy is a really great example that we looked at of just something that's a superstar. But um, I would definitely be seeing better results and I'm sure I'd have a better bricks on these melons because if they had a better start, they ripened earlier in the season, you had more heat, it just in general would be, would be much better. The other crazy thing here is these cucumbers and someone I think was commenting that they won't even get to the top of this or something. This cucumber already, basically, if I straighten this out and put it up to this wire, it's already at the top. These are 10 foot long T posts I put in the ground. They go in two feet, so it's already at eight feet. And this is kind of what I was worried about, is the height of all these plants, is why I really wanted to get something so big and why this looks like a jungle gym over here. Um, but there, I've already produced, by the way, uh, three jars of cucumbers, uh, pickles, excuse me. So there's one down here I have to come in here and pick these. I have been a bit behind actually, but I've already produced really, uh, what did I say? Three jars of pickles. And that's those big ball jars. It's, I'm not talking about how many ounces is that? Maybe uh, the 32 ounce jars, I think it is. Not the small ones. And that's only from, by the way, uh, how many tomato, how many cucumber plants? That's only two cucumber plants. So growing them vertically like this uh, has netted me insane production this early in the season. I've been super, super impressed. Uh, this is, by the way, the, a cucumber here called um, the National Pickling Cucumber. And as I said, it's just super, super productive. The other one I have here, I have a third cucumber that is a fresh eating cucumber that I really like. It's called the Bait Alpha. I have one down here that I'm gonna show you guys. Yeah, there's at least, at least five, here's six cucumbers that I can pickle and actually create probably a whole new jar of uh, pickles. It's just, this is insane. I'm telling you guys, growing this food vertically saves so much space. This is, <laughs> this is seven cucumbers right here. Seven. The bait alpha, by the way, I really, really like it. Um, it does uh, 
seem to fruit a lot easier than others. It pollinates well simply because I need to wash this thing off actually. It's kind of dirty. But it has a special genetic something to it where um, it's a good greenhouse cucumber and then it pollinates almost all the flowers get pollinated whereas some of these other cucumbers they they may get pollinated but they don't form the fruits and there's kind of a problem with that i forget the exact reason but uh this is one that's super super productive oddly enough the national has been beating it out like every single time so far this season and uh i've been eating about one of these a day whereas the national actually is getting me maybe like two a day or maybe two every other day, something like that. What I really like about this cucumber, guys, is that it's not bitter at all. It's so smooth. It's so good. It's so sweet. It has this perfect cucumber flavor to it. I'm a huge fan of this cucumber, I'll tell you. Um, anyway. So that's the one I eat, and the, the other ones I pickle. Maybe you can make a cucumber salad out of the ones, the bait alpha or something like that. This, um, these pepper plants have come together. I was really um, kind of down on this whole, <laughs> this whole bed back here, just simply because we didn't have the greatest start with our transplants. Even the eggplants on the other side of the tomatillo here is fruiting or flowering at this point. Here's another volunteer tomato that came up. No greenhouse and you know it's just covered in fruits. This is probably a black cherry if I had a guess or a seedling. A, a, uh, this is probably at this point a grandchild of black cherry and of course I got the figs back here and I have to be really careful about making sure that these things aren't taking up too much sunlight away from the figs. It's always a fight for um, for sunlight back here. But here's my little one walkway. <laughs> and I just come in here, I do my pruning, I do my trellising, and uh, there's another walkway that goes out this way, but for the most part, it's just so dense, so jam-packed in here that uh, it's kind of crazy. And I think personally, we'll, I'm gonna try to get you guys a good view of this but it's just crazy how much food you can grow in such a small area. Um, and these guys, they're just gonna keep going. They're not gonna stop. They're gonna reach the top of this. They're gonna sprawl out on top. They're gonna sprawl out on top of each other. I'm probably gonna have to take out some plants and thin some things out pretty well. Um, this is really, I've only done this twice or so where I you know, transplanted the tomatoes in or yeah, transplanted the tomatoes in, and then I only had to wrap them around the string like twice so far. I've been pretty, um, pretty bad about it, to be honest with you, but if you really wanted to be lazy and you had other things to do, this is a lot less work than I had originally at least thought. Um, it takes some time to do all these tomato plants, I'll tell you that, but if you really want to be a bit lazier about it, uh, you don't have to do it religiously. Eventually, by the way, just getting them in their own little space, I've realized that they kind of support themselves. You don't really even need these strings at a certain point. Um, so I think very soon as they get up to here, I'm gonna let them kind of just sprawl out in every which way direction and hope I get you know, a taste of each one, evaluate each of the tomatoes. There's 50 different varieties of tomatoes here. Um, the cucumbers and the melons, you gotta trellis them up like probably, you know, a lot more than I have these tomatoes. And uh, it's definitely a good idea to take care of those, definitely more than these tomatoes. We got the herb garden in the front. I have, you know, just the simple Genovese basil here. We're gonna make some pesto and I even, try, I put in some more seeds. We got rosemary down here. You got the uh, oregano and thyme. I have some nasturtiums in, in front. This is some weird thing now that I'm trying. It's called a Gretti. It's an interesting little Italian uh, annual that I think just stuck it in the herb garden and we'll see what, what turns out of that. But yeah, you get your herbs right next to the tomatoes, right next to most of the summer garden. 
I got my beans over there. We're in business, baby. So uh, this is extremely potent, by the way. Holy crap. We'll see you guys soon, all right? Thanks for watching. Follow along with the garden as we go. I'm gonna keep you guys updated. We're gonna talk about a lot of these tomatoes, a lot of these melons, hopefully, as we go throughout the season. We'll see you soon.